So it is eight o'clock. The class begins. Welcome everybody on this fall dreary day where I'm at. I don't know about you guys, but it's kind of rainy and dreary. But it's fall and I love fall. Um, we're going to start with chapter five as we talk about receivables and how we account for sales of goods or sales of, of, of services. So I will say this chapter, it's good you're here today because there are some aspects of it that can confuse people. And I am going to just do the best I can to just try to simplify it for you so it clicks and it makes sense for you guys. Y'all cool with that? So we are going to cover a lot today. I'm just going to start right away. We know we handle the accrual basis of accounting. The accrual basis recognize, recognizes our revenues when they um, we have completed them and given them to the um, customer and we recognize our costs by matching those revenues they help to create. A credit sale is when we transfer either products or services to a customer today, but we plan to collect the cash in the future. Sometimes these credit sales are called sales on account or services on account. And this is very common in many, many business transactions. As a result of credit sales, we will show an account receivable, which is the cash that's owed to the company by those customers from the sales or services on account. Now remember, if you think about it, we um, provide a service or a sale to a customer. When that transaction has occurred, we debit our accounts receivable and we credit our revenue. So here's a good example. Lynx Dental charges $500 for teeth whitening. I think I screwed up on some of these. DK decides to have her teeth whitened on March 1st but doesn't have cash at the time, pay cash at the time of services. So she promises to pay the $500 whitening fee to link by March 31st. So in this case, the company would record a debit to accounts receivable for 500 and a credit to service revenue for 500. So as you can tell, the company in their books records an asset, which is the accounts receivable, is an asset. And they also record a, devin, a, a revenue when they sell products and services to their customers on account, planning they're gonna get paid in the very near future. Now, that's an accounts receivable. Sometimes we have what's called non-trade receivables. These originate from other sources than from customers. So it could be interest receivable because we've um, let money to someone, loans by the company, and we could have loans from um, executives to the company or um, stockholders or employees. So the loan would be, um, it, when interest is being um, accrued, be a receivable. Notes receivable are held for formal credit arrangements evidenced by a written instrument. So oftentimes when notes receivable happen, it's generally because the, um, the customer couldn't maybe pay an accounts receivable, but they wanted to extend it a little more. 
So therefore, they create a formal transaction with the evidence of a written promissory note and interest collected. So, uh, which of the following is sometimes called trade receivables? Well, I pushed the answer already. Accounts receivable are sometimes called trade receivables. Now, whenever we're dealing with sales, we have all kinds of um, accounts associated with sales because of just the nature of the business and the nature of the way we handle services or transactions in, um, in this climate. Trade discounts are very common. Basically, it's a reduction in the list price of a product or service. This is generally used to provide incentives to larger customers or certain consumer groups like the senior citizens or the military. What happens with the trade receivable is just the sales price is a different amount. We don't take into account for trade discounts by showing anything on in our books, apart from just saying the if links normally charges 500, but because um, you're a senior citizen, he's going to give it to you 20% off. Then what we do is just record the true price a senior citizen is paying. So in this case, it would be a debit to accounts receivable for 400 and a credit to service revenue for 400. Remember with a trade discount, we just record the revenue for the lower amount. Now that's a little different when we're dealing with sales returns and allowances. When you think about it, a sales return, the transaction has already taken place. And for some reason, the customer is unhappy. So they're dissatisfied with the product. And so when a sales return occurs, it's truly the customer totally returns the product. Under a sales allowance, the customer doesn't return the product. Now, the seller may issue a cash refund if, because what's happening is under a sales allowance, something isn't perfect, but the customer will still keep it. So the seller might issue a portion of a cash refund, or if it was on accounts receivable, the seller would reduce the balance of the accounts receivable if it was on account. For a sales return, the seller's going to issue a cash refund if the original sale was for cash, or again, if it's on account, the seller would reduce the balance of the accounts receivable. So a sales allowance after getting her teeth whitened, not whited on March 1st, D notifies Dr. Link on March 5th that another dentist is offering the same procedure for $350. So Dr. Link reduces D's account by $50. So this has, the, the, the procedure has already occurred. The account has already um, been shown. And when Dr. Link a week later reduces the account, we truly show a debit to a sales allowance account and we reduce our accounts receivable by $50 because she is not going to owe that much money anymore. We call this sales returns or sales allowance accounts contra revenue accounts. This will get reported with the total revenue in the income statement, but then we'll be able to see these contra accounts below it to see how many sales returns have taken place, 
how many sales allowances have been granted. <laughs> Sometimes students misclassify contra revenue accounts as expenses. They're not an expense. They're not a cost of creating those revenues. They are debit balances and they do ultimately reduce the amount of net income, but contra revenues represent reductions of revenues, whereas expenses represent the separate costs of generating those revenues. So expenses would be the salaries, the utilities. These sales returns really are a reduction against the revenues. Now, we've got something called sales discounts. So we talked about trades, sell trades. Um, we have returns and allowances, and now we have what's called a discount. In this case, there's an offer to a customer. You say to the customer, if payment is made within a specified period of time, you will get a discount. So Lynx Dental offers D terms, 210 net 30 on the 350 BOs. What that means is if you pay within 10 days, you will get a 2% discount. 210, 2% discount if you pay within 10 days, Otherwise, we want you to pay the entire balance in 30 days. D pays on March 10th within that 10 day window. So because D pays within that 10 day window, we're gonna record a sales discount. Now basically the way the sales discount works is we debit cash, for $343. We debit sales discounts for $7. And we credit the entire accounts receivable for $350. So she has fulfilled her payment by $343 because she paid within 10 days. Because of that 10 day window, she gets a 2% discount on her $350, which is the $7 discount. This also is a contra revenue account. We report this alongside of total revenues, but since sales discount is a debit normal balance, we're gonna report that as a negative uh, balance along with our revenues. So here is a picture of what an income statement can look like when we're dealing with sales allowances and sales discounts, as you see right here. Excuse me, I'm switching my computer, but let me know if my sound isn't as strong. Excuse me, I'm just regrouping here, guys. Okay, sorry about that. So you see here, the service revenue does not show 500. The service revenue here shows 400 because that is truly what they're selling, selling the service for. Then we have our contra accounts right below it. We have our sales allowance 50 and we have our sales discount of seven for our net service revenue to be $343. Now, let's look at the accounts receivable transactions. Do you see, we started with a debit in accounts receivable for $400 back on March 1st. 
then when we found that someone else was offering them cheaper and she called the office, we at that time debited our sales allowance of 50 and we credited accounts receivable. We reduced what she owes us. Then when she took advantage of the um, sales discount and she uh, paid the bill, it was at that time we credited the entire 350 because she debited cash at 343. We debited cash. We debited the sales discount of seven and we credited the entire accounts receivable. She has fulfilled what her balance is. Who wants to take this one? The effect of a sales allowance will result in which of the following? Will it be an increase to net income? Will it be a decrease to net income? An increase to accounts receivable or an increase to sales revenue? Any ideas? Ultimately, the sales allowance reduces our net income, doesn't it? The sales allowance decreases our sales revenue in the income statement, but it also decreases our assets by lowering the balance of accounts receivable. How about this one, guys? Who wants to take this one? Which of the following computations would be used to compute net revenue? Would it be total revenue plus accounts receivable minus sales discounts minus sales allowances? Would it be net revenue plus sales allowances minus sales discounts? Would it be total revenue minus sales discounts minus sales allowances? Or would it be net income minus the changes in accounts receivable? Any ideas? It should be C. Excellent. You're exactly right. It should be C. The revenue is in the income statement, the sales discounts and sales allowances are contra accounts against our total revenue. Now, how do we go about uh, reporting this? on the income statement. One thing, excuse me, this is income statement reporting revenues, net of sales discounts. This slide right here shows you how an income statement would look when we take into account sales discounts and sales returns and sales allowances. We just net them. We just reduce it. Okay. I think before we start the next section, we're going to turn in, uh, look at some homework that will um, help cement these concepts. Okay. This, this is kind of the easy part of this chapter. So I want to take our time. Let's cover this portion 
be able to move on from it so we can spend the majority of the time in this next section. So if it's okay, I'm just going to get myself in here and go into some homework. We're in chapter five. So, the following Record the necessary transaction. Rashi, Data Recovery Services specializes in data recovery from crashed hard drives. The price charged varies based on the extent of damage and the amount of data being recovered. DRS offers a 10% discount to students and faculty of the educational institutions. Consider the following transactions, and we're going to record the necessary transactions for data recovery services on each date. June 10th. Now, I'm going to have you guys help me here. Rashid's hard drive crashes, and he sends it to DRS. Guess what I did there, guys? Is there a journal entry? Just because it crashes and he sends it to DRS? Has an economic event occurred? No. No, it has not. Therefore, there is no journal entry that would be required in that transaction. Number two. After initial evaluation, DRS emails Rashid to let him know that full data recovery will cost $2,700. Any thoughts? Has an economic event occurred? Isn't this just a bid? Yeah, it's just a bid because they haven't done any work yet and he hasn't paid anything yet. You're exactly right. It is just a bid. There's nothing that's happened here, guys. I'm just going to make sure I'm right. Check my work. You see how you go back there? Number Three. Rashid informs DRS that he would like them to recover the data and that he is a student at UCLA qualifying him for a 10% educational discount and reducing the cost by $270. No journal entry? No journal entry. Guys, this is excellent. Number four. DRS performs the work and claims to be successful in recovering all data. DRS asks Rashid to pay within 30 days of today's date offering a 2% discount for payment within 10 days. So has a transaction happened now? Mm, no. Perform the service? He, they have provided the service, haven't they? They performed the work and DRS is asking Rashid to pay within 30 days. So we're going to show, they said it was 2,700, right? 
and they were getting a 10% discount. So 2,700 minus 270 is, someone smart help me, 2,430? Twenty-four thirty. Twenty-four thirty. So, what are we going to debit? Accounts receivable. Accounts receivable. And service revenue. And credit. How many agree? Awesome. Okay. Now, number five. When Rashid receives the hard drive, he notices the DRS did not successfully recover all his data. Approximately 30% of the data has not been recovered and he informs DRS. No journal entry. No journal entry. Excellent, guys. Next. DRS reduces the amount Rashid owes by 30%. Debit what? Credit what? Mm, sales allowance. Sales allowances. 2430 times 30% equals this times 3729. Okay. You guys agree with my number? Yeah. What kind of receivable? Yeah. Let's make sure I have the right number there. Perfect. Okay. Got it so far? Yes. Then on June 30th, Rashid pays the amount owed. What was the, um, they offer a 2% discount if paid within 10 days. Did he pay it within 10 days? Mm, no. No. So he owes the uh, 2430 minus 729 uh, equals this minus this. 1701. Do you guys agree that that's the amount of the balance? Cash. Any questions? Is that kind of making sense, guys? The difference between the various contra accounts? Now, they want us to show how all this is going to be play out in the financial statement. Those total revenues, was it 24.30? And didn't we have a sales allowance of 7.29? Didn't we?
Where'd you get the 2430? Okay, remember the price was supposed to be 2700. But if you were a student or a teacher at an educational institution, you got a 10% discount. You remember that? Yeah. So we we started with 2430 because that discount is really just the real price, the revenue. We don't show the 2700 minus the discount. It's really what they're paying is 2430, not 2700. Okay, that makes sense. Then we do take into account the allowance because he didn't get recover 30%, he did allow for a 30% allowance on that 2430. Okay. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Any questions? Okay, let's go to the next part. Now, we're going to calculate what would net revenues have been if he had paid his bill within that 10 days? Instead of it being 1701, what would it have been, guys? Was it a 2% discount? Any thoughts? Sixteen sixty six point ninety eight. Excellent. Excellent. Now, here's another one. But I'm not going to go through that because, guys, it's the same. Oh, oh we're not ready for this one yet because this now gets into what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the next portion of this chapter, which many people can feel overwhelmed by. But guys, the good thing is you're in here, you're paying attention, and I'm going to try to, I don't like the word dumb it down, that sounds negative, but I'm going to keep it so simple if you hear how we're gonna do this. Now guys, the important piece one of the principles in accounting is called conservatism, which means we want to only record our assets at a realistic value. We never want to overstate our revenues or our assets. We never want to understate our liabilities. <clears throat> and so what we're doing is we are looking at our revenue, our receivables, and we're gonna say, okay, we know in this world, we are not gonna get every penny we're supposed to. People are not going to pay. So we need to record our accounts receivable, what we're planning to receive back from customers. We need to create a realizable value of what cash we really expect to collect. <clears throat> and so since we're on the accrual basis, 
we need to estimate today our future uncollectible accounts because the estimate to show that will be bad debts, we need to record today against the revenues they help to create. So when we come up with <coughs> an allowance for uncollectibles, <coughs> we will reduce our assets accordingly and we're going to create an expense, which we'll call bad debt expense. Remember the key with the accrual accounting is we record our revenues when they've been earned and we record our expenses in the period that they helped create the revenues. So this bad debt expense, the debts that we are not going to receive, we need to record in this period. Even though we might not have those bad debts, a year down the road. We've got to estimate them. So under this allowance method, we have to estimate future uncollectible accounts and we're going to record those estimates in this current period, this current year. Estimated uncollectible accounts will reduce our assets because we're gonna create a contra account against accounts receivable, and they're going to increase our expenses. So there's a couple ways we can determine what will be uncollectible. Based on history, we can look at the um, balance sheet and take a percent of receivables method to determine our uncollectible accounts. In doing this, what we do is at the end of 2018, Kimsey's owed 20 million from customers. And Kimsey estimates that 30% of that accounts receivable is not going to get collected. So in that event, we debit our expense, the bad debt expense, but we credit this new account we are just seeing now, that's a contra account against our asset accounts receivable called allowance for uncollectible accounts of six million. What does this do? This shows the expense, that debt expense in the current period of 6 million. And we have a contra account against our receivables of six, which then will really show that our true accounts receivable balance will be the 20 million minus our allowance for uncollectibles of six gives us a new balance of 14 million in our accounts receivable. So I'm jumping ahead of myself, I'm sorry. The credit sales of 50 minus that bad debt expense, that's what's gonna show up on the income statement. The Allowance for uncollectibles, we'll see in a bit, is going to show up on our balance sheet. So look at how this works. During the year, we are making all these credit sales. At the end of 2018, we show an accounts receivable of 20 million on our books but we need to estimate how much of this are we gonna collect next year and how much are we not gonna collect? But because we need to match our revenues with our expenses and we need to appropriately account for how much 
is truly the asset accounts receivable, we need to create an allowance by the end of the year. So it's here in our balance sheet where we show the accounts receivable of 20 million less our allowance for uncollectibles, which we show to be 6 million for a true net accounts receivable that we will show on our books of 14 million. Okay. Now, as we move on here, <clears throat> when we adjust for the estimates of future uncollectibles, we're matching our expenses, the bad debts, in the same period as the revenues or the credit sales they help to generate. So when we record an allowance for uncollectible accounts correctly, what we're doing is we are reporting the accounts receivable at what we consider to be their net realizable value. We want, don't want to overstate the accounts we're really going to receive. So we adjust it by this allowance to estimate what we believe based on history we will collect. Because allowance <coughs> for uncollectible accounts has a normal credit balance, people think it's a liability. But guys, it's not a liability. No, it has a normal credit balance like a liability, but in this scenario, we treat it as a contra account against a related asset. Who wants to take this one? Which of the following is true regarding allowance for uncollectible accounts? It is a liability account. <clears throat> it is added to the total of sales discounts, sales returns, and sales allowances. No, those are contra accounts to the revenue account. This is a contra account to our accounts receivable which is on the balance sheet. No allowance for uncollectibles is related to accounts receivable, which is an asset on the balance sheet. This allowance along with our accounts receivable, the net will give us the accounts receivable net realizable value we anticipate to receive. Now, there's other ways to calculate bad debt. One, which I think is pretty realistic, is using what we call the aging method. We look at our accounts receivable and we see the amounts that are not yet due, we see the accounts that are one to 60 days past due. 
we see the accounts that are 61 to um, 120 days past due. We see the ones that are more than 120 days past due. Now, if you think about it, the farther out we go, the more unlikely we're going to collect our money. Does that make sense? It's just going to be harder to collect that money. So what they do is they account for an estimated percent uncollectible based on the age. So you see the percent increases as we get older, the accounts receivable gets older. So what we'll do is we take and create the estimate amount uncollectible to be 5 million. We show 10% on the current amount not yet due. We show 30% on the one to 60 day invoices has to. We show 50% on the 3 million, the 61 to 120 past due. And then more than 120 days past due, we take 70% of that to come up with a total estimated uncollectible amount to be 5 million. So what we do, it makes sense to come up with aging the receivables because it's more accurate than just taking the accounts receivable and applying a number. In this case, we're going to debit our bad debt expense for 5 million. That's the expense. We're going to credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts for 5 million. So this question says, which of the following is not true about the aging method? A, no estimate for uncollectible accounts is made. No, we're still making one. Number B, or part B, older accounts are more likely to be collected. No, the opposite is true. Older accounts we are determining are less likely to be collected. It is not acceptable for GAP. Yeah, it's acceptable for GAP. Or D, older accounts are less likely to be collected. What do you guys think? Older accounts are less likely to be collected. So using the aging method to estimate our uncollectible accounts is more accurate than just applying a single percentage to all accounts receivable. The aging method recognizes that the longer accounts are past due, the less likely they're going to be collected. Now, what we have done is we have created an estimate and we have also come up with the bad debt expense. So we match our expenses with the revenues they help to generate in the current period. And we come up with what we believe is a reasonable allowance for uncollectible accounts that adjusts our accounts receivable to be what we consider the net realizable value. So now let's say an account receivable is uncollected. Now, how do we treat it? 
what is it we do so we record this accounts receivable appropriately? When we know a customer is not going to pay, the company writes off the customer's account balance as uncollectible. But here's what you do. You reduce the balance of the accounts receivable. And we're also going to reduce the balance of the allowance for uncollectible accounts. So think about it. We're going to credit our accounts receivable for the particular account that's not, we're not going to collect. And we're going to debit the allowance for uncollectibles. As you see here, when we write off a specific account, it won't have any effect on total assets or total expenses for that matter because we've already recorded the bad debt in the previous year. All we're doing is we've allowed for this allowance for uncollectibles. So when we write off a specific account, we've got an allowance standing by to offset it with. Kimsey receives notice that Bruce Ely's filed bankruptcy and we're not gonna get the 4,000 he owes us. So we debit our allowance for uncollectibles of 4,000 and we credit his particular account receivable for 4,000. It reduces or decreases the contra account allowance for uncollectibles it decreases the asset, but ultimately it won't have any effect on total assets because we showed our accounts receivable minus our allowance, our contra account allowance. And so it's not going to ultimately affect our net balance. Students often mistake by recording bad debt expense when they write, write off an uncollectible account. No, the bad debt expense was recorded in the previous year at the time when we estimated our uncollectible accounts. So what happens when Bruce later pays 25% of the amount owed? Remember, we had previously written off his account. So what we now need to do is restate the thousand he's going to pay. So we debit his accounts receivable a thousand. We now he's going to pay us. We credit the allowance. We then debit our cash and credit his particular accounts receivable for the thousand that he's going to pay. Again, this collection doesn't have any effect on our total assets or our total income. We took care of that in the previous year when we estimated our uncollectibles. Who wants to take this one? When writing off an uncollectible account, do we debit or A, bad debt expenses debited no b net income is decreased c total assets are unchanged or d the allowance account is credited net income is decreased any other thoughts C. C. Remember, it's C because the write off of an accounts receivable has no effect on the um, total amounts reported in the balance sheet or in the income statement. There's no decrease in total assets or no decrease in net income. We took care of that when we debited our bad debt expense and we credited our allowance for uncollectibles in that year in which we made the revenues. 
Now, when we write off an uncollectible, we debit our allowance for uncollectible accounts and we credit that specific accounts receivable. So it will not have an effect. Now, I, I wanna do some work on this. This can be challenging and then this in the following year can be, become more confusing. So let's go back to our homework. Okay, we're gonna look at number four here. Now, the following events occur for Morris Engineering during 2021 and 2022, its first two years of operation. February 2nd, 2021. Provide services to customers on account for $35,600. What are we going to do there? We're going to work on this together, guys. What are we going to do? So, debit account receivable and credit services revenue. Excellent. Number two, when we receive 25,000 from customers on account, what are we gonna do? Pass 25,000 on the debit and then accounts receivable, 25,000. Estimate that 30% of uncollected accounts will not be received. How much is that? Won't it be our sales Won't it be our sales were 35.6, right? Or let me do it this way. Our accounts receivable was 35.6. And let me do it even better than that. I'm sorry, guys. We had this at 35.6 and we collected how much? 25, right? So it, what is our balance now? Isn't our balance 10,600? Correct? And it told us that 30% of the uncollectible accounts will not be received. So 30% of 10,600 is 3,180. What are we going to do to show this allowance for uncollectibles. 
that debit expense? We debit that debt expense for thirty-one eighty. And then the allowance for uncollectible accounts. Excellent. Thirty-one eighty. We credit our allowance for uncollectibles of thirty-one eighty. Okay. Number four. We now provided services to customers on account for forty-eight thousand six hundred. We debit accounts receivable. Accounts receivable. And service revenue. Four six and, and, and service revenue for forty six for forty eight thousand six hundred. Excellent. Everyone agree? Okay. We received six thousand from customers for services provided in 2021. Cash and accounts receivable. Excellent. I'm keeping a running total here, guys. See what I'm doing? Get it? Next. We're going to write off the remaining amounts owed from services provided in 2021. So, in 2021, we provided 35.6, we got 25, so there was 10,600 left, okay? So, there were 10,600 left in services back in that we had not collected for. We assumed 30% were gonna be uncollectible, okay? We, we received six of that 10,600 amount, right? So think about it. We had 10,600 that was still outstanding in 2021. Got it? We collected 6,000 in 2022 for the 2021 sales, which means, oopsie. which means that what has not been collected is $3,400, not collected. Does that make sense, what I'm telling you? If at the end of the year, we owed 10,000, we were owed due 10,600, in 2022, we collected 6,000 of the 10,600. That means 3,400 
of those accounts, they're telling us it's time to write it off. It's time to just say, we're not collecting it, let's write it off. In order to do that, we would be debiting our allowance for uncollectible accounts of 3,400. And what do we credit? Accounts receivable. Accounts receivable for 3,400. Do you see what happens? We created an estimate allowance for uncollectibles back at the end of 2021, because we knew this was going to happen. So we create a debit to our bad debt expense. So we wrote these expenses off back then. We knew this was going to happen. That's why we create this allowance for uncollectibles. So when in fact we do write off individual accounts, it's not going to affect our overall net realizable accounts receivable. Now it's telling us we received 43,000 from customers for services provided in 2022. We debit our cash for 43,000. And what do we credit? Not receivable. Okay. So what did we end up writing off that one um, particular uh, 3,400 we wrote off? Now we collected 43,000 here. Got it? Wouldn't that be on the other, wouldn't that be on the debit side though? We collected 43,000, um, so we would have debited cash when we collected it, and we credit accounts receivable. See, this is, this 48.6, we collected 43,000 of this 48.6. That make sense? Yeah. So what is our net accounts receivable now? We would know by adding, adding these and subtracting this. That was cute. We should have a net balance here of 6,800 sitting in our accounts receivable. That makes sense? Make sense? Let's also create an account that's called allowance for uncollectibles to see where we're at. Okay, what did we do? We started with, it told us that 30% of the uncollectible accounts will not be received. So do you see here how we debited our bad expense and we credited allowance for uncollectibles of 3180? That was over here, 3180. Then, do you remember 
seen here how it told us that the write off the remaining amounts owed? Do you see how we debited our allowance here of 3,400? See that? What do we have sitting in our accounts for uncollectibles right now? Twenty debit. That makes sense. Yes. I don't want, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but we'll just do this one. Then we received 43,000 from customers provided in 22. We took that. And then it tells us in 2022, we're gonna estimate that 30% of the uncollected accounts will not be received. So, this is where we're now going to go back to the side. Because what's happening is in the current year, the very beginning year, it's easy to determine it. But when we go into the next year, it gets not more confusing, another step. Recall when using the aging method, Kimsey estimated bad debts in 2019 to be 5 million. But the actual bad debts in 2019 were only 4 million. In other words, the bad debts for 2019 were overestimated by a million. So we overdid it, but we didn't know that. How can you know it? It's all an estimate. But then in the next year, Kimsey estimates bad debts in 2020 to be 8 million. Okay, so do we see if we estimate bad debts in 2020 to be 8 million, we get to take into account how we overestimated the year before bad debts. So we know we estimated 5 million in 2019. We wrote off 4 million. So we have a balance sitting in our allowance of an X of a million we didn't write off. So at the end of 19, they now estimate our allowance will be 8 million. The bottom balance here needs to be 8 million. Therefore, how much do we adjust our books? We adjust our books by 7 million. Why? Because since we overdid it the year before, we take that into account because 8 million isn't what we're going to necessarily write off. 8 million needs to be the ending balance in our allowance for uncollectibles. So our bad debt expense and our credit to allowance for uncollectibles is going to be 7 million in order to make our ending balance 8 million. As you see in year two, we will show a bad debt expense of 7 million. Just because since this is an estimate and we continually upgrade it, sometimes we're going to overstate it Sometimes we're going to understate it, but we continually are upgrading the balance. The 8 million is going to be here in our allowance for uncollectibles. 
So then our net accounts receivable here is 22 million. So let's look at this. So this will help you see this. Did you put pencil? What if actual bad debts in 2019 were 6 million compared to an estimate of 5 million? What happened here, guys, is we understated our bad debts. We estimated five, they really were six. So going into the adjustment, we are a debit here of 1 million. So when we estimate in 2020 that our allowance should be eight, we're estimating our allowance to be eight. What does our journal entry need to be? Well, do you see to adjust for us understating it the year before? We are then going to debit our bad debt expense of nine million and credit our allowance for uncollectible accounts of nine million. That is the same concept when I go back to our problem here. And it says we're going to estimate that 30% of the uncollectible accounts will not be received. Well, whoops, 30% of the uncollectible accounts of 6,800. What is 30%? of the 6,800, that means 2,040 should be here. 2,040 needs to be our allowance for uncollectibles here. But what is our journal entry we are going to do to get this to be 2040. It's going to be this plus uh, this minus it's going to be 2260 because in order to get this 2040 we are going to need to debit bad debt expense of 2260 and credit our allowance for uncollectible accounts of 2016. I'm right. Okay, what did I do wrong? Allowance for uncollectible accounts. Accounts receivable, 3,400. Oh, this is 3,400 is wrong. This is okay, let me just. So I don't screw us all up. Go to the instructor view since I'm obviously doing something wrong here. Okay. What did I do wrong? For, oh, it was 4,400. How did I screw that up? Oh, 10 six. Guys, I, I'm so sorry. I screwed this up thinking it was 3,400. This is 4,400. And as a result of that, it's going to change this number to 5,800. And 5,800 times 30% is 1740. Helps to be right. So this number should be 19. Okay, let's go through this. 
So I make sure I'm not screwing you guys up. Because I made an error on this 4400, which then screwed me up. Let's start again. Okay. Accounts receivable and service revenue 344. We agree with that. Or wait a minute. Is this a new amount? Yes, all these numbers change somehow. I guess this isn't the exact same one I initially had. Yeah, all this has changed. Let's go through this one so I don't mess you guys up. <coughs> when we provide services to customers on account for 34400 what we're going to do I'm going to get rid of all these. So these numbers somehow changed on me. Um, so when we provide services to customers on account for 34400 we are going to show a debit to accounts receivable 34400 Okay? Then it tells us we received 24,000 from customers on account. That means we would debit our cash for 24,000 and we would credit our accounts receivable for 24,000. Then it tells us here we estimate that 25% of uncollected accounts will not be received. 25% of uncollected accounts would not be received. So our allowance would be the 34 minus our 24 is 10,400 and it's telling us 30%, I just want to confirm this, or 25% will not be received. So 10,400 times 25% is $2,600. We debit our bad debt expense at 2,600, we credit our allowance for 2600 so we're going to put 2600 in our allowance for uncollectibles here okay then it then tells us on april 12th we provide services to customers on account for 47400 so we debit accounts receivable for 47,400 and we credit our service revenue for 47,400. Then on June 28th, it said we received 6,000 from customers for services provided in 2021. If we receive 6,000 for customers provided in 2021, that is the 344 minus the 24,000, or we had accounts receivable of 10,400 left over, and we've got 6,000 of that we did collect, which means we've got outstanding $4,400, correct? Does that make sense? We have $4,400 remaining. 
So it says, write off the remaining amounts owed from services provided in 2021. We are going to debit our allowance for uncollectibles of 4,400, and we're gonna credit our accounts receivable for 4,400. What we're doing here, guys, is we have now zeroed out any accounts receivable that we owed from the previous year. Okay, now it says we've collected cash from our sales, received 42,000 from customers for services provided in 2022, debit our cash of 42,000, credit our accounts receivable for 42,000. So we have remaining here, the 47.4 minus we've collected 42,000 in this year, which means we have 5,400 that's outstanding, okay? Now it says, we estimate that 25% of uncollected accounts will not be received. So in that case, we are going to show that the 5,400 here that's left over, 25% of that isn't going to be received. So the 5,400, 25% of 5,400 is 1,350. Got it? So we know 1,350 won't be received on this balance. So what do we need to do in order to adjust this? We're going to need to show this number right here to be 1350. Our new allowance for uncollectibles needs to be 1350. But what do we need to prepare a journal entry for to get this number to be 1350. As you see here, we've got a $2,600 allowance to begin with, but then we added, we made adjustments of 4,400 in order to, um, excuse me, we were actually wrote off true accounts of 4,400. We only had 2,600 re showing as an allowance. So what we need to do to make, in fact, this new number 1,350, is we're gonna need to prepare a journal entry of bad debt expense for 31.50 and credit our allowance for uncollectible, honey, 31.50 for us to end up with 1350 as our bottom number. So again, we debit our bad debt expense, 3150. We credit our allowance for uncollectibles, 3150, in order to end up with an allowance for uncollectibles here of 1350.
It's easy the first year. The second year, we need to be reminded that the new balance, it tells us the accounts receivable X amount will be uncollectible. That amount goes here. And we are going to need to plug in the appropriate journal entry in order to meet this ending balance. And the reason is because it's always an estimate. Some years we're going to overestimate. Some years we're going to underestimate. But we always play like a catch up, a plug in. Does that make sense? Where did we get the 1350? Sorry. It's okay. But where we got the 1350 is if we take our debits and our credits here in accounts receivable, we end up with a $5,400 balance. Okay? Because ultimately these two got written off by our six and our 4,400. So the 344 and here's our credit of 24, six and 4,400, those wipe out, zero out. The 47.4 minus what we received of 42,000 gives us a balance of 5,400. 25% of this number they say is not going to be collected. The 25% of 5,400 is 1,350. That's what we want this balance in our allowance for uncollectibles to be is 1350. In order to make that balance 1350, we have to plug in a number based on what really happened the year before. The year before we estimated an allowance to be 2600. But our actual write-offs ended up being 4,400 with a debit balance in our uncollectibles. Meaning, in order to get this a credit balance of 1,350, we needed to credit this account 3,150. Now, why? Because in the year before, we thought our bad debt expense was just 2,600 when in fact it was 4,400. So we put 2,600, but we actually wrote off bad debts of 4,400. So what we're doing is accounting for those bad debts we wrote off, but we didn't show because it, it was just an estimate. So for this year, if we think we're going to have bad debts of 1,350, we also need to take into account the bad debts we wrote off the year before, but we have not accounted for yet, which is why we have to credit, we debit our bad debt expense of 3150. We credit our allowance for uncollectibles of 3150. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. We're going to do some more problems, guys. Hang in there with me. When an entry is made to write off an uncollectible account, we ultimately the total accounts receivable is unchanged. Because when we actually write off an account, we debit our allowance for uncollectibles, we credit our accounts receivable. Overall, it's not going to affect our balance. <clears throat> Let's do another one. Let's. Go into our book.
and find chapter five. Oh, let's do the exercises. Let me. Okay. Let's do exercise five ten here. Mercy Hospital has the following balances on December 31st, 2021 before any adjustment. Accounts receivable, 70,000, and allowance for uncollectible accounts of $1,400 credit. Mercy estimates uncollectible accounts based on an aging of how receivables as shown below. So it shows us that we've got those not yet due a 15% uncollectible on the current balance, the current not yet due. Zero to 30 past due, 20% of the 11,000. 31 to 90 days past due, 45%. More than 90 days past due, 85%. So we've got to go in here and we're going to estimate the amount of uncollectible receivables. We're going to record the adjustment for uncollectible amounts on December 31st and then calculate the net accounts receivable. Okay? So, and this is exercise two or five, I'm trying to think which one it was. Five. Grace Hospital. Where am I? Where did, oh, there I am, 510. Okay. So, what we're going to do here is first of all, figure out what we're going to determine the estimated amount uncollectible to be. 50,000 times 15% 15 is our 7,500. 11,000 at 20% is our 2,200. Then we've got 8,000 at 45% is 3,600. 1,000 at 85% is 850. For a total of 14,000, 150. That is what we want our ending balance to be. So let me just do it this way. Actually, here we want our allowance here to be 14,150. That's the number we want. But it tells us before any adjustment, our accounts receivable is showing at 70,000. 
and our allowance for uncollectibles is showing at $1,400 credit. This is 70,000. This is a $1,400 credit. Okay. So the first thing we know, what is the amount of uncollectible receivables? We estimated that to be 14,150. Okay. The next thing it says is record the adjustment for uncollectible accounts on December 31st. 2021. What journal entry do we need to get to this 14,150? Don't we need 12,750 to be credited to get to 14,150? We would show a bad debt expense of 12,750 and we would credit the allowance for uncollectible accounts to be 12,750 in order to arrive at the ending allowance for uncollectible account to be 14,150 because they told us allowance had a credit account sitting in there we needed to adjust it accordingly for this number to be 14,150. If this number was a $1,400 debit, not a credit, it would have been a different story. We would have needed then Would need a journal entry of 15,550 to then make this 14,150. But that's not the case. This didn't say it was a debit, it said it was a credit. So as a result, we need the 12,750. Does that make sense? Now, the last question says, calculate our net accounts receivable. Remember, the way we calculate net accounts receivable is we take our accounts receivable, which is our 70,000, then we do less our allowance for uncollectibles, which is, and this is a minus, hmm. our net realizable accounts receivable is going to be the difference. 70,000 minus our 14,150 for net realizable receivables of 55,850 that you see right here. Does that make sense? Let that sink in one second. Should we do some more problems? Does that help to do some problems? Anybody? Um, in the chat room, how many want to do some more problems? 
type yes or no. Hey, Nancy. Yes. I was just wondering if later we could go over um, a problem from the homework again. Absolutely. Uh, problem 17, I was just having trouble figuring out what to do during the set. But right now, are we okay to do that right now, guys? Hey, I haven't gotten there yet, so I will do that, sweetie, okay? Okay, thank you. Let's look at another problem, because I really think this is the best way to learn, guys. E511. The physical therapy center specializes in helping patients regain motor skills after serious accidents. The center has the following balances on December 31st, 2021 before any adjustments. Receivables, 110,000. Allowance for uncollectible accounts, a $4,000 debit. First thing I do, see how I just set it up? I just set it up right now, okay? The center estimates uncollectible accounts based on an aging of accounts receivable as shown below. So we've got our not yet due, 60,000, 4%. We've got our 2,400 here. Zero to 60 days past due. 26,000 at 20%, 5,200. Our 61 to 120 days past due, our 16,000 at 30%, which would be, Lord, 1632, 48 or 4,900. And then our past due of 120, 8,000 at 85%. So instead of guessing here, here is our numbers. So the estimated bad debt, or excuse me, the what we want our allowance for uncollectibles to be is 19.2. The question asked us, estimate the amount of uncollectible receivables. That is 19.2 which means that's what we want this balance to be guys 19.2 okay that's why i like to show you these t accounts because you can see where this number needs to go and maybe it doesn't work for you i'm so visual that it helps me to lay it out so we want our balance and our allowance for uncollectibles to be 19.2. We need to record the adjustment for the uncollectible accounts on December 31st, 2021. We need a debit to bad debt expense and a credit to our allowance for uncollectibles. What is this number going to be? Well, isn't it going to be 
to arrive at this 19.2, we need to add the 4,000. What this debit and allowance for uncollectibles means to me is we ended up having more um, actual write-offs, bad debt write-offs, than we allowed for, accounted for previously. Does that make sense? That's why it's sitting there. So this needs to be a debit of 23,200. Allowance for uncollectibles needs to be a credit for 23,200 to get this 19.2. Then it asks us, calculate the net accounts receivable. Well, won't those net accounts receivable be the 110 accounts receivable balance less the allowance for uncollectibles, as you see here, 19.2. And that net balance should be 90,800. Does anyone have questions on how I figured this out? Anybody? Let's look at another one. Well, trying to think of one here. Let's do exercise five, seven. During 2021, it's first year of operations. So guys, that's easy. In the first year of operations, we don't have any balances sitting there. Pave Construction provides services on account of 160,000. By the end of 2021, cash collections on these accounts totaled 110. Pave estimates that 25% of the uncollected accounts will be uncollectible. So let me just set this up. Okay. Right now, this was 160 in account sales. And then they collected 110,000 on their accounts, which means 50,000 is remaining. Right? It's telling us 25% of the uncollectible accounts will be, uh, of the uncollected accounts will be uncollectible. So we need to record the adjustment for uncollectible accounts on December 31st, 2021. What are we going to do, guys? We're going to take our 50,000 that are sitting in our accounts receivable times 25%. Since there was no beginning balance sitting in our allowance for uncollectibles, we want this number to be 12,500. Since nothing is previously recorded 
our journal entry is going to be a debit to bad debt expense of 12,500 and a credit to allowance for uncollectibles of 12,500. Okay. Now it says In 2022, the company writes off uncollectible accounts of 10,000. Okay? So it literally writes off $10,000 in bad accounts. So we need to record the write off of accounts receivable in 2022. As you see, to actually write off accounts, we would debit our allowance for uncollectibles, 10,000, and we would clearly write off accounts receivable of 10,000. So that means we would write off 10,000 as a credit accounts receivable. Here, we would debit. 10,000, okay, in our allowance for uncollectibles. What is our new balance sitting in our allowance for uncollectibles? Isn't it a credit of 2,500? And our accounts receivable is sitting at 40,000? Right? Then requirement three, assume the same facts as above, but assume actual write-offs in 2022 were 15,000. Record the write-off of accounts receivable in 2022 and calculate the balance of allowance accounts at the end of 2022. Well, what that means is instead of 10, they want us to do 15. This number would then be 35. And wouldn't this be a $2,500 ending debit balance. You see here, this would be a $2,500 debit balance. As it sees, it indicates the account has a negative balance. Okay, let's look at one more, then we will move on because I'm running behind and I'm so sorry, guys, um, that I'm running behind on you. Let's look at exercise 5-8. Physician's Hospital has the following balances. It has an accounts receivable of 60, and it has a allowance for uncollectibles, a credit of 1100. Okay, so this is 60. And this is a credit of 1100. On December 31st, physicians estimates uncollectible accounts to be 15% of accounts receivable. Record the adjustment for uncollectible accounts. Determine the amount at which bad debt expenses are reported in the income statement and the allowance. Whoopsie, sorry. Um, and calculate the net accounts receivable. So, 
we know if we need to show 15% of 60,000, okay, would be $9,000, wouldn't it? So our, what we want to have here is 9,000. But what is the journal entry we need to do to get that? We would do our nine minus our credit here or show 7,900 to get that balance. Okay. Debit or bad debt expense, 7,900. Credit our allowance for 7,900. What is our bad debt expense? It's 7,900. What is our allowance for uncollectibles? It's 9,000. Okay. Calculate net accounts receivable. The net account receivable is our 60,000 minus our allowance for uncollectibles which gives us our net accounts receivable of 51,000. How many of you guys is it kind of clicking with? Any questions? Let's move on. Now, the direct write-off method is the easy way, but it's not GAAP approved, generally accepted accounting principles. You write off bad debts only at the time they're uncollectible. Unlike the allowance method, which requires an estimation before they incur, it's really straightforward. The only time people really use this is when the uncollectible accounts are not material. So to compare the allowance method versus the direct write-off method, for the direct write-off method, there are no adjustments. It's just you write off an account and you, you debit your bad debt expense, you write off the account. It's not generally accepted accounting principles approved unless, like they said, you're not going to have any um, bad debts, which is pretty much null and void in this day and age. Under the allowance method, you write off the bad debt when you create the estimate. And then when you actually write off your accounts, you debit your allowance, you credit your accounts receivable. Since the direct write-off method has no adjustments, you just write your bad debt expense off when the account is uncollectible. But it doesn't match our bad debt expense in the year in which we recorded the revenues. That's why we don't allow it. Okay. Um, some students think firms should reduce total assets and record bad debt expense at the time the bad debt actually occurs. Remember the whole reason we set up this allowance is we anticipate future bad debts and establish an allowance for those estimates. So I want to move on here. You guys can look through these. Notes receivable, we touch on lightly. And an accounting for notes receivable in interest revenue. Notes receivable is a written promissory note. It's an agreement. And we can classify them as current or non-current based on when the due date is. Generally, there's a promissory note here that shows the information. When Kimsey provides $10,000 of services to Justin Payne, who can't pay immediately, Justin signs a promissory note offering to pay $10,000 plus 12% interest in six months. So what we do there is we debit our notes receivable and we credit service revenue because we're accepting a six-month promissory note. 
So we don't record interest right away because we haven't earned any interest yet. Their notes receivable are similar to accounts receivable, except it's a formal credit arrangement. Now, after six months, Kimsey collects the full amount owed by Justin. We determine what's collected by the note receivable of 10,000. And to determine the interest, we take the face amount times the interest rate of 12% times six months out of 12 months. Remember, the interest rate is always set up as an annual rate, but we pay six months or half of that for six months. So we're gonna debit our cash, we'll credit our notes receivable, and we will credit our interest revenue for 600. As you see, when we calculate interest, Depending on if we are going to go from one year into the next, we may be showing interest revenue in 18, but then in 19, we're going to end up collecting it all. So know that if this happened over a two year period, we're going to show that interest is received, receivable at the end of 2018 for $200. And then when we finally collect the note, we're gonna show the interest revenue from 2019 of 400, the interest receivable from 2018 of 200, and we'll credit our notes receivable for 10,000 for total cash to be 10,600. Why do we do this? When we're over two years, we need to show, it's six months, but it's taking place over two years, two months in one year, four months in the next. We need to show our accurate assets, revenues here. So we need to show, we have earned $200 of interest. We just haven't collected it yet, okay? So um, I'm not going to worry about the ratios here. Let's go to the one um, that I believe Alicia had a question on. Alicia, what number was it? 17. I actually had the question. It's for 17. On April 15, 2021, Samson Consulting provides services to a customer for $95,000. To pay for the services, the customer signs a three-year 12% note. The face amount is due at the end of the third year, while annual interest is due each April 15th. Hint, because the note is accepted during the middle of the month, Samson plans to recognize one half month of interest revenue in April 2021 and one half month of interest revenue in April of 2024. Record the acceptance of the note. We'll debit our notes receivable for 95,000. We will credit our cash for 95,000. Now, we need to show on number two, record the interest collected on April 15th for 2022 and 2023, and the adjustment for interest revenue for December 31st, 21, 22, and 23. So the way in which we calculate this interest is it's a $95,000 balance, a 12% note. How many months are we going to record interest for in 2021? 
3.5. Well, basically, we're going to take our 95,000 times our 12% interest rate annual times eight and a half months over 12 months. So I was wrong, nine and a half. Remember, half of the month of April, then we have May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. We have eight and a half months in 2021. So our 95,000 times 12% times eight and a half divided by 12 is 8,075. We're gonna debit our interest receivable. We're gonna credit our interest revenue. Now, in April of 15th of 2022, they need to pay us the entire 12 months of interest, 95,000 times 12%. So 95,000 times 12% is 11,400. The interest receivable from December of 2021 is our 8,075. We're receiving it now. We show a credit to interest revenue of the difference, three and a half months. So 95,000 times 12% times 3.5 divided by 12 is our 33.25. Now, this is going to happen for three years in a row. So we're basically doing the three years, you know, the two and a half. And then in the final year, we're not just going to pay interest. We're going to pay the note off plus the 11.4 of interest. And we're going to credit our interest receivable from the end of the year with our interest. Does this make sense, guys? Well, guys, that, I mean, this chapter, what ch is challenging about it is really understanding the allowance for uncollectibles and how each year when we determine that allowance that is actually our balance in the allowance for uncollectibles and based on whatever we currently have as a credit or a debit in that balance we're going to adjust for to come up with our bad debts that if you can get that in your you know click that in your head it makes this chapter so easy. Will you guys bless you, take care, and we will see you in the chat room, in the discussion.